So first, I want to thank everyone for coming to this conference in general, but also to uh, today and uh, giving me this opportunity. I want to thank, obviously, the organizers of the conference and uh, especially Julian. Uh, having seen his middle name, I feel like it's appropriate to call him my Albany Virgil, um, which, which may not be fair to Albany, but is, is, is fair to Julian. So thank you very much. So, uh, as Julian said, uh, my name is Moisir Dessa Pereira, and I'm an assistant professor faculty fellow at NYU in the English department. Um, I list here my email address and my Twitter name, um, mostly because uh, we'll have time to talk about this sort of stuff later, but if you think of anything or are too shy or, or anything like that, um, I strongly encourage you to take opportunity of these uh, modes of communication to tell me where I could do better. So, okay, uh, what follows is, it's kind of weird because it's all completely brand new stuff. Um, these ideas have been kicking around in my head for a while. This is the basis of my monograph, Making Maps. It's called Making Maps, and then it has some kind of subhead that keeps changing. And being invited to give this talk and reading about the, uh, the theme really put a lot of the, the ideas into motion. So though I am to talk about wandering without, without a map, I do have a map for this conversation. And uh, again, I appreciate your patience and look forward to the conversation afterwards. So let's, let's put some balls of conflict into motion. Um, the first gambit here uh, might be familiar. This might be a story you know. But even so, I hope to tell it in a new way. This is a 19th century drawing of the Collegium Albertinum, which is the oldest building in the University of Königsberg. Uh, it, it doesn't exist anymore. It was bombed to dust by the Royal Air Force. But here it looks rather similar to how it looked at the beginning of the 18th century. So I ask you to imagine yourself uh, that you're a student back then, in the beginning of the 18th century. So you're about a generation older than Immanuel Kant, um, whose tomb more or less lies in this area right now, um, behind the cathedral. This is all behind the cathedral on Kneiphof, which is Kalingrad's um, central island. So let's say it's one in the morning and you've been drinking with your classmates. This is a, a contemporary image of what that might have looked like. Um, and so invariably, so the story goes, the challenge will arise. Can you cross all seven bridges across the Prego River once and only once? So maybe you wager with your classmates that this time for sure you can do it, and you think you have the answer. So you step into the bracing Baltic winds, and the walking begins. And if you're by the, by the Collegium, maybe you, you cross the nearest bridge, which is now called the Natovi Most, or the Honey Bridge. But none of us was alive in the early 1700s, so it might help to get kind of a sense of uh, the nature of this challenge, of what it means to cross these seven bridges. So here is uh, a reproduction of a map from uh, the early 17th century, but I've colored in the river so you can kind of see the bridges. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here's the castle. And here's the cathedral, and here's the, the collegium. Furthermore, because we're not in Königsberg, and most of the applicable bridges have been destroyed anyway, we can't actually get drunk and totter uh, from bridge to bridge. I've sort of made an approximation of what could follow here, um, but performing the challenge you're negotiating with your classmates can take several forms. I suggested stumbling out and walking late at night, mostly just to have the opportunity of alliterating bracing and Baltic. You could also, for example, list the steps out, uh, turning the journey into something resembling uh, driving directions or what we'd expect a GPS to tell us these days. So you have cross this bridge, then that bridge, and then, oops, you messed up again. So this, this, uh, these directions here are reproduced. This is what that looks like. And the attempted solution can look like driving directions or it can look like a sketched out path on a map, which can be either sketched out on a tabletop or a napkin or on a map. Uh, the directions, so like I said, the directions in the previous slide look like this. And each way the challenge or the, each way of tackling this challenge involves a sort of subtle shift. 
what on the previous slide could be considered as a kind of traversing of space, not a transversing, but a traversing of space, here instead we have a traversed space. There's no change in this map. The path is frozen, and in fact, this map describes two paths, or at least two paths, uh, to and fro. The motion, the process, all that's out of this. Uh, it's gone. The map has been ripped from its narrative energy, uh, the narrative energy of your nighttime prowl, and what you could consider as an event has been turned into datum, has been an, an item of data. Events become data. So two similar examples. Here we have, this is from Nightwood. I don't know if these credits are, are very legible. Yeah. Great. Uh, so Robin Vogt has taken to wandering away from her husband. And here we see her moving through various churches in Paris. Uh, Juna Barnes doesn't give us an itinerary per se, but uh, we can compare this passage um, and this is an important passage, so I'll give a, give a second for you to catch up and look at it. Uh, we can compare this passage to its rendering as data. And this takes a second to load anyway. There we go. So here, again, Robin's straying is frozen. Uh, Barnes clusters the locations, the locations narratively. So we see here, many churches saw her, boom, 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 you get three churches right away. And then they are also clustered here geographically. And then the uh, second cluster is here when she strays into the uh, Rue Picapus. And then there's a third, an indistinct Russian church in which there is no pew between them. So like I said, here the clustering is geographical as opposed to narrative, uh, where you have the Rive Gauche churches and the Rive Droite convent. And I made the sort of editorial decision, which I I think there's a historical basis for that when the narrator says she went to a Russian church without a pew, they have in mind the Nevsky Cathedral in Paris. So here we've got so far Königsberg, Paris, two nighttime wanderings. Uh, and here it's no longer night, uh, but now it's, now it's morning, late morning. Nevertheless, Oedipamas is also wandering, partly in search of the elusive sign of the, the muted post horn. But she's also partly fleeing, and even once she catches a strong lead of the muted post horns, she ends up in Oakland, not recognizing her surroundings, until finally she notices that 24 hours have elapsed, and she's literally where she began, in front of John Nefastus' house. So as data, that looks something like this, uh, the San Francisco side of it. So a map draws a strong line from the center of San Francisco to Oakland, but it seems very weird to think of this as a kind of representation of the quoted, quoted paragraph in full, and especially not even the beginning of the second, which is in Oakland and has this landscape that has lost all variety and ends up making Oedipa herself lost. So you have these three examples, and there's a lot going on in them, and the latter two I'll save for more detailed examination that makes up the actual bulk of this talk. But I want to finish with our Königsberg dilemma and aim to show that uh, that drunken set of challenges demonstrates something to us about space. So in 1735, Leonard Euler presents a paper before the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences. When published, the article includes a map of Königsberg. This is more or less what it looks like. I would consider this to be a map, a step removed from any sort of map one would use to move around in the city. And because as you can see, Kneipoff becomes just the letter A. Each bridge is a lowercase letter. Euler is trying to prove once and for all that it's impossible to cross all seven bridges once and only once. So even for someone who's not terribly mathematically inclined like me, the proof actually reads, uh, reads really easily in English. And it leads to this conclusion that I've excerpted here. So, but the story here has moved from our fiction, our imagined fiction of stumbling around drunk to enumerating directions to now Euler's completely sterilized reframing of the question. People are out of this equation, buildings are out of this equation, and places become just letters. So you had GPS directions, then the sort of less precise pink path 
and now this abstracted map, and then you get to this. Uh, so current accounts, and in textbooks, uh, when you read about Euler's proof, this is what it looks like. So it's not even talking about regiones and pontes, like regions and bridges anymore. Uh, here the bridges are edges, and the shores of the Prego circle around uh, vertices. Narrative to map to this. This is a graph, which is the locus of interest for the branch of mathematics graph theory that emerged out of Euler's paper. Um, so it's tempting to read this as a progression from the particular to the universal, because Euler, after all, is trying to solve a universal problem. What is the, what is the universal law by which we can determine if you can cross all the bridges of a, uh, in a certain city once and only once? Um, I tried this with Albany, it doesn't work. Apparently there are no bridges in Albany. So, so sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> but, uh, but New York City uh, gets really complicated, uh, and it really depends on how you count what counts as a bridge or doesn't. Um, if you take only the bridges that connect one borough with another, the answer is no, because only, only Queens has an even number of bridges. And remember, you can have a maximum of two odd-numbered bridges for it to work. So everyone else has, a, has an odd number. But the, what's, what's funny is, is or, is that this shift from the universal to, or sorry, the shift from a certain particular, the particularity of the Königsberg problem to a universal solution to it has its own particularity because, as I mentioned, the people, the buildings, all of that is faded out. And now because the central issue is and has always already been the question of the bridges, which is to say the universal rule regarding what is or is not an, an Eulerian or Eulerian path is so specific as to be basically useless. A map of Königsberg uh, could have several uses, a graph far fewer. So to me, this is a little bit startling because I think that we're trained to think of maps as not just sort of telling a story, but of telling the whole story. This is the front page, for example, of Esri's story maps package. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Esri. Esri is the famous slash infamous company uh, behind ArcGIS, a hilariously expensive suite of software for geographical analysis. So, and so here they're saying this, this idea that everyone has a story to tell and maps can tell your story. Maps can cover, the, can, can cover this narrative ground. So Esri markets a demographics package for the low price of two and a half thousand dollars a year. Uh, that, as they say, can help you, I'm sure it's more expensive for university libraries, whereas they say it can help you understand the unique characteristics of a population based on a specific location. So here, Esri is, is leveraging the far-reaching power of the big data, big database, constructing, uh, in, in Catherine Hales's words, the, rela the relational juxtapositions that then await narrative to make the juxtapositions meaningful through interpretation. So what's, this, is, this is the exact opposite of the bridges problem, because Esri is selling the universality of their product in the sense that the unique characteristics of a specific location exist in that Esri promises the user the unique characteristics of all specific locations. So they ride on this power. They rely on this power of the interoperability of databases and this, this is something that Hales brings up, because for Hales, narratives are too constrained. They're too reliant on the speaker. You need the databases to, to sort of mobilize these new, uh, these new answers. And Esri offers all those answer, answers in contrast, presuming that technology and mapping have these narrative solutions built into them. So it's hard to look at this page, and this is a bit of shooting fish in the barrel, without thinking of how uh, Donna Haraway calls cartography the chief tool metaphor of technoscience. One way of describing Haraway's view of cartography would be to look at her description of the fantasy of objectivity that you get from vision. A disembodied subject observes his, and you know it has to be his, object or objects of inquiry, studying them without affecting them at all. That gaze, that's the gaze of the conqueror. Uh, and the vast Cartesian expanse the conqueror sees and uses for his maps, as Doreen Massey notes, narrativize and embody the strategies and tactics of the settler colonists and conquistadores. 
conquering becomes this kind of model of production as well, where despite the fantasy of being an unmediated observer, that, that God's eye is actually creating these techno monsters. The lab, their cartographer studio, and now the computer, both as a gaming device and as a data analysis tool, situate this reproduction of techno science, thereby also pursuing the goals of techno scientific lubrication for capital. And it's, it's hard for maps to shake this idea, this connection to transparency, which we see whenever we say a map is wrong. Um, it's not the case that being wrong is a distinction that only some maps have, which should make them worthy of some kind of critique. All maps are wrong. That's the only reason we can make sense of them. So for example, this map is not wrong in that it demonstrates the impossibility of completing an, an Eulerian path in New York City, but for nearly any other purpose, like getting me from my apartment to Penn Station yesterday morning, it's a travesty. It's wrong just because it doesn't present the information I expect. My maps that you'll see are wrong too, and turning to the text, the story, the narrative, uh, sorry, turning the text, the story, the narrative into data instead of keeping it as a narrative and plotting it on a map does tremendous damage to something, it seems. But it's not entirely clear how to describe what that something is. So hence, starting this talk with asking you to imagine yourselves as drunk Prussian students in Königsberg, because as students, you relied on maps in your head uh, when, you're, when you're in the bar. Uh, you relied on these maps in your head on, on what Kevin Lynch calls environmental images that provide this image of the city. And so that's how, when sitting in that hospitium and drinking the night away, you know ahead of time that your proposed path won't work. On crossing the Kleimabuka back towards the castle, you realize there's no way to get back to Kneiphof without using one of the bridges you already used. And in the case of Oedipa and Robin, on first glance, it seems that they move outside of their environmental images of their cities as well, having wandered into a state of being lost, both literally and metaphorically, as we have here. Uh, further, as they move into areas less sketched in in their images, the distinctions become fainter. A Russian church, not the Nevsky Cathedral. Or, as in Oakland, the landscape becomes indistinct lacking mental touch points that can bring the picture into focus. So Lynch prioritizes this uh, masculinist visuality with his image of the city, focusing, as he says, on, on the physicality of the city as the independent variable. That's what gives it its legibility. But nevertheless, the visuality is put into a space of movement and change. And more importantly, Lynch allows for the observer to be affected by the image and the other way around. The reciprocity regrounds this conquering eye, situating it and making it available for uh, what Haraway calls feminist objectivity. So that is to say that even though Lynch's image favors the visual, Haraway shows that we can abstract that out somewhat, layering onto the map meanings beyond those generated by just visual sense data. So as a result, it's possible to take the five components that Lynch has for these environmental images and read them not quite as literally as Lynch intends to. So paths are the first one. Paths are basically what earlier in a graph we would call the edges. They are the channels of movement that are predominant in these mental images. Not to be confused with edges on a graph, edges here are breaks in continuity. And these are, this is what I'll be focusing on mostly. They are barriers, seams, and organizing features. Nodes are similar to the vertices in the graph, um, but they are strategically located innumerable points that are typically junctions uh, between paths, often including moments of shift, subway to bus, for example. Districts are homogeneous, enterable areas that are always di distinguishable from inside, mm -hmm. and landmarks, on the other hand, are unenterable points of reference. So here's a map from Lynch's book, The Image of the City. Uh, it's of Boston, coincident uh, two coincidences now. So it's coincidentally a map of Boston, which was also the map in the Esri demographics uh, slide from earlier. And also it answers 
the question of what the central artery used to look like, the answer is this is, do I have this right? Yeah, this is the central artery. So I, I actually remember the central artery is uh, two or three stories in the air, green, and just like cutting through the city. So we can see all, all five components of the map at work here. Here's the, the scale in how Lynch's respondents, and this is a very empirical work. He interviewed people uh, about how they see the city, how they read the city, uh, how these respondents conceive of the city in their minds. And as I said, most important for the rest of this talk will be these edges. But, and so here we can see how the Charles River creates a very strong edge, a very strong border for Boston. Um, that closes in the extent of Boston, and then the central artery, which uh, is, is here again, um, serves as another edge that tears through the middle of the city. So as, as Lynch says, the central artery is very disruptive. What's Space, that? what's that? I was going to say that and have an Albany. Uh, the uh, central artery. When you look at the Empire Plaza, it was incredibly disruptive. Uh, okay. So space is not, importantly, just smooth space open for movement. It's not just paths everywhere linking nodes together. Disruptions, barriers, other obstacles not only prevent movement, but even force the formation of new paths to go around them. And these obstructions are what I'd sort of fancifully, for the nature of this talk, call rocks. But I was thinking about how obstacles can also uh, sometimes move, like blockers on a football field. They wander alongside the wanderer, and as wandering rocks, they are threats to whatever is trying to move past them, uh, be they doves, ships, or robin vote, or Oedipa Moss. So the question becomes, what are the kinds of rocks that Robin faces, and how can we try to imagine the heterogeneous space in which she moves and in which her own movement is hindered? So uh, Nightwood takes place mostly in Paris. This is the map that accompanies the Expanded critical edition by Charles Plum. Plum's map uh, is, to me, unsatisfying, mostly because it focuses just on the sixth arrondissement. And the map, so the map inflicts its own edges on the stories it can tell about Nightwood, even within Paris. Because if we recall, just from that short passage of Robin Vogt's Wandering, much more than the sixth arrondissement, which is here, is in play. And we see here how actually the narrator maps stuff on both sides of the scent. And in fact, if we return to the actual passage, we can even infer a narrative path here. So it's not just places, like I said, that are clustered together, but we can actually imagine her as, as walking this as a route. So is the narrator providing us with a list of places that she visited or the trajectory of her journey? So does she end up at the Congregation of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary over here in the, or over in the 12th arrondissement in Picpus Cemetery where Lafayette is buried, or is that just the end of the list? So unlike the step-by-step -step instructions of trying and, and failing to walk the Königsberg bridges, instead here the narrator gestures at a course of movement and small wonder that Robin, while avoiding her husband, ends up in a distant American end of Paris reflecting on her upcoming disappearance to America with Nora Flood. So let's get the audience to speed about Nightwood, because Nightwood is often described as the novel everyone's heard of but no one's read, which is a shame because it's short um, and, and great. Um, so published in 1936, Nightwood by Gina Barnes, as I mentioned, is a short novel that uh, it's under 50,000 words, uh, is a short novel that concerns itself with five people who spend most of the novel in Paris. So Robin Vogt is the first one. She's, she's a young American who takes to wandering and drinking at night. She marries and has a child with Felix Volkbein, a fake aristocrat of Jewish ancestry who is searching for real aristocracy. Um, she leaves Felix for Nora Flood, another American, uh, before leaving Nora for Jenny Petherbridge, a much older, four times divorced woman of means. Whether Jenny is American or not is a fascinating question that uh, I will pursue in the future. And commenting on all of this is the body and complex 
Irish-American doctor from San Francisco, Matthew O'Connor. Um, the novel ends back in the US with Robin and Nora and Nora's dog somehow ambiguously reunited in some way, and we'll get to that. So back to Robin then. And this trip of hers, in fact, is unique in the novel in that it's the only time in the novel that the narrator inhabits Robin's thoughts or describes her actions in any, uh, from her point of view. Typically, Robin is only reported on by either Felix, Nora, or, uh, by Felix, Nora, or Jenny to Dr. O'Connor. As a crude point of comparison, uh, she has about 260 words of dialogue in the whole novel, and uh, over half of that is reported speech from other people saying what Robin said. So despite the seeming freedom of her wandering here, the narrator actually tells us very little about it, giving this example within Paris, and then also talking about how she would take to wander in generally in, in the US and in Europe. At one point, uh, it says, once not having returned for three days and Felix nearly beside himself with terror, she walked in late at night and said that she had been halfway to Berlin. So where are Robin's barriers then? So much as Felix leads her to wandering by demanding to know where his unborn child is, uh, where are Robin's rocks? If I add the places where Felix, that Felix either mentions or visits, the topography of the city starts to fill in a little bit while also gesturing towards Felix's own peculiarities. His claims to aristocracy and financial security are indicated by the fact that he works at uh, Crédit Lyonnais and by the doctor's suggestion that they dine in the Bois de Boulogne. And he also circulates in the 6th arrondissement with Dr. O'Connor, uh, which is where they both meet Robin when the doctor is asked to wake her up because she's passed out. And their own courtship progresses along the spine here from the Jardin de Luxembourg up to the Seine, um, along the spine of Rue Bonaparte. So when Robin leaves Felix, like I said, she goes to New York where she meets Nora. When they return, Nora buys an apartment. That apartment is here. It's um, chosen by Robin. And within two paragraphs of their, their getting into that apartment, the narrator reports that the time came that Nora was alone most of the night and part of the day. So they get the apartment and, and Robin is immediately wandering again. So Robin becomes the wanderer again, Nora merely chases, and uh, other than an incident in Montparnasse, uh, Nora is rather pushed out of the geogra geographic space of the novel. Um, and Jenny, with the quote, collective income four dead husbands could afford, uh, lives in a much more aristocratic Paris. She lives up the Champs-Élysées up here, and goes to the opera here, which is where she actually meets Robin, and dines both in the Bois de Boulogne and at Ambassadeur, um, because as the narrator Riley notes, Jenny feared meeting Nora. So she is familiar with Nora and Robin's apartment. She drops Robin off at the apartment once, but her expansive region, this area, you know, sort of the Jenny area of Paris, pushes on Nora's. Uh, which is perfectly fitting because the chapter in which she's introduced is called The Squatter and in includes this observation from the narrator, which, is which explains that Jenny can only impersonate and fill in regions to choke away the originals that she is copying. So even, even the central story that's related to her in the novel, in the narrative, which is of a carriage trip with Robin, with Robin Dr. O'Connor, the young girl Sylvia, and an English woman that Robin picks up at one of Jenny's parties, is copied, so the main story is duplicated, told once from the perspective of the narrator and once from O'Connor's perspective. And we can, we can see it on the map, and I'll explain it in a second, because as Alex Christie and Katie Tanigawa note, in the two tellings of the stories, the trajectories are reversed. So when the narrator describes the story, they leave Jenny's, which is somewhere around here, and head for the Bois, which is here, and then soon after they are, quote, long past the pond, which is here, long past the pond and the park, and we're circling back again toward the lower parts of town. And then Jenny strikes Robin, and they drop Robin off at the apartment. In O'Connor's retelling, however, quote, we went riding down the Champs-Élysées, crossed, uh, went straight as a die over the Pont Neuf, and then whirled around into Rue de Cherche Midi, God forgive us. The forest, the Bois de Boulogne is completely ignored. 
And then finally, when we add O'Connor to this map, we see that the image spreads widely over the city in comparison. Uh, not only is, in, is he involved in the many places with other characters, but he himself details some digressions about his, uh, how he goes cruising for men in the Bastille, how he uh, tries to masturbate in the uh, Saint Mary church here and fails, uh, and so on. And so, uh, but we can see, once we plot all five characters, just how far away Robin's trip to the Picpus Cemetery actually is. So some close reading now might actually better place Robin within the city. When Felix and O'Connor come across her at her hotel, the narrator presents Robin as a kind of phantasm. First, her hotel is so indistinct that it could move, it could move through the night unnoticed, the very hotel, much in the way Robin aims to. Robin herself is described as somnambule, uh, the word that also names the chapter in which we meet Robin. Robin moves at night like a sleepwalker, but also flitting between these two worlds, between being awake and being asleep. Furthermore, the narrator frequently gestures towards a destruction or ephemerality to Robin. So here, her life has these luminous deteriorations. A few paragraphs later, and after trying to get her to her feet and prove she's all right, the narrator describes how she, quote, fell back into the pose of her annihilation. Uh, Felix is overcome by her instability. She's at once a static statue, static like a map, but also she shows the effect of the wind on her. A person not quite split, it's too easy to say split, but more out of phase. And later, after Robin has left Felix, Felix meets O'Connor and tells him he is in mental trouble. The two men dine in the Bois de Boulogne, and Felix begins to recount Robin to the doctor. Again, with language of uncertainty, fluidity. His description of her, again, as an image, relies on this fantasy of detemporalization, similar to that of the map, where an object can be frozen long enough for deep observation. Even thinking of Robin as a fixed object in the past, as uh, Felix sees his own family history, uh, or that's how he sees his own family history, because it was given to him only from one source, and even that doesn't work. He can't even see Robin as a historical object. But we're looking for rocks here, however, and Robin, but the problem is that Robin doesn't really seem to have any, at least none we can see. She is, in fact, an exercise in this very uncertainty herself. The empty, the empty center, in the words of Teresa de Loretis, around which the lives and passions of the others spin. Uh, Loretis also describes how Robin, at the end of the novel, shows an excess of affect that excess seems to render Robin diffuse, exploded all over the map, exploded all over the map into invisibility, like atoms inside um, a, a box. Felix can only see snapshots of her, images that are useless as soon as they exist. Here, O'Connor tells Nora that Robin is, is this eternal momentary, moving out of the frame with every tick, and yet, Capturing Robin's elusivity is precisely what O'Connor commands Nora to do. She has to bend time backwards and bring Robin to her. And here's the spatial twist in the novel, because where this fate gets unspun. In aiming to form a sense of the image of the city with Robin at the center, drawing her paths, edges, and regions, hunting for her rocks, it may be that Robin's spectrality is precisely why her wandering contributes no image. She's all image herself represented to the reader in others' narratives, always the you who is addressed and never the I who expresses. So recall the clearest edge here, this one here between Nora and Jenny. Jenny dines at Ambassadeurs because, again, she's afraid of running into Nora. And when uh, the only time when they uh, uh, come, into, come into some kind of contact uh, spatially by accident or so, Jenny is stopped in the garden, disinclined to go further and confront Nora as well, reaching her own edge. So even though she sort of is able to ex expand her pressure over the course of Paris, when it comes to the apartment, she stops at the garden. Nora eventually crosses this edge and meets with Jenny, uh, which leads to Robin's leaving Nora and without a word. 
So as Robin appears too unstable, too out of phase, herself too much of a wandering rock to be affected by any sort of edges, we see Jenny with her own edges in contrast. And here, uh, the narrator describes Nora in detail for the first, this, and so here the narrator is describing Nora in detail for the first time. So where Robin is an ephemeral flicker, like an old television not quite catching the right frequency, Nora is its opposite wholly observable and visible. And her visibility is always tied in with this underlying trope of motion in the novel. Throughout the novel, there's this, this trope of, of descent, the downward motion of the bow down and the decline of the descent. As a body moving through space with weight and distinction, Nora responds to paths and edges. She has an image of the city, hence, even if she can barely see herself in it. So Robin's impermanence in comparison to Nora's shows the degree to which Robin herself paradoxically in her ephemerality hems Robin in. Robin goes out at night and wanders everywhere. She meets everyone, as Nora says, while Nora stays at home, worried that putting the slightest piece of furniture out of the way will mean Robin never returns. And at the same time, Nora is an obstacle for Robin. That, this begins to resemble uh, the state of what Lauren Berlant calls cruel optimism when your object of desire is also an obstacle to your flourishing. So out of wits herself, Nora becomes the sleuth following the wanderer. And this is the image with which I'll close this reading of Nightwood. Uh, Nora collapses the image of her love uh, for Robin with this image of the city, with a pauper as both the initial image and incompletely formed component of the city. The city wants to forget the pauper in order to move forward past its beginnings. Nora, as the one who cannot forget, cannot move forward. Surrounded by edges, she can only emulate Robin and look inward. But becoming Robin means shifting into Robin's space, into her city. Yet even so, the image is both familiar, incestuous, and different, underscored by how when Nora attempts to bring a man to bed to wipe the slate clean, he flees in confusion after seeing the wooden horses in the bedroom, which stand in for the toys that Robin would play with while also watching Nora, transitively, uh, to make sure that in Nora's words, no one called, the bell did not ring, and I got no mail, and so on. So as Nora sighs after her list of what Robin forbade her from doing, Nora sighs, my life was hers. So in mapping out Nightwood, in looking for all these edges and rocks, the wanderer becomes Nora, who takes her travels to a European scale in order to find, Nora, uh, to find Robin. After telling O'Connor of her encounter with the sailor, she reiterates trips that she took to Marseille, to Tangier, to Naples, ending with, in her words, that center of eroticism and death, thinking of melting together with Robin as though they were both made of wax. O'Connor, upon hearing this, just wordlessly gets up and leaves. The ringmaster of the this, of this circus of the novel can fabricate no response. There is no plan anymore. So this idea of fabricating a plan takes me to the second test. This text, this reading is shorter, um, which is a return to the Oedipa of the title and the rock she encounters trying to execute peace in Verarity's will. Like Nora sleuths Robin, so too does Oedipa spend the novel sleuthing, even congratulating herself at one point for wearing flats. Uh, as a prophylactic against the labor of walking while following her various leads. Nevertheless, early in the novel, the narrator gives us a different fabricated yet imposing plan. So San Narciso is the, is the sort of company town that in variety I think founded, um, and it's a fictional city. It's near LA, we know, and it is also, despite being a fictional city, it is the most commonly mentioned place in the entire novel. Oedipus settles there in order to take care of her affairs, leaving her house and husband uh, behind in the Bay Area in the similarly fictional city of Kinneret among the Pines. Yet the narrator here already uses a rhetoric we recognize from Lynch in terms of a fractured and disrupted image. San Narciso isn't a city with an image possible. It's illegible in Lynch's terms. It's in, because instead it's a pastiche of land use. And with the narrator's sly joke at the end of this passage, the implication is that all of Southern California is equally illegible, unclear, and fractured, a finding Lynch 
incidentally, contests in his own studies of central Los Angeles, but just central Los Angeles. So nevertheless, for Oedipa, there is a kind of unifying logic in its own, in its own uniformity. From her vantage point above San Narciso, she sees the fabricated plan in the same way we would see a circuit board for a radio, which of course only works because it's a circuit, meaning everything on the board is connected to everything else. To the inhabitants, there may be no image of the city, but Oedipa senses one underneath, a pattern that's trying to express itself amidst the seemingly chaotically distributed urban elements. So. So Narciso's fictionality plays a vital role in imagining the space of Crying of Law 49. The narrator has already, with Oedipus' help, made a stark distinction between the Bay Area and Southern California. And if we read that divide against the quote unquote real places in the novel and the fictional or fake for brevity, um, fake places in the novel, we see an alignment in the Bay Area with mappable places that correspond to the worlds for the, of the reader, or could, while places in Los Angeles exist more just in Pinchon's imagination. And this is, of course, in contrast with Nightwood, where basically all the places are, are mappable in some sense. So these are the raw numbers for uh, specific places. So in other words, of the 20 places, um, 20 total places mentioned uh, in the LA area, seven are real and 13 are fake. So, but let's add instead how many times total these real and fake places are mentioned in the LA and Bay Area. And now we see how central San Narciso becomes the novel. The entire geography Pinchon creates from Echo Courts, where Oedipa stays, through Tremaine's swastika shop, which is mentioned only at the end of the novel, San Narciso contributes to this majority of the fictionality of the novel's geography as a whole. Another way, when the novel looks to Los Angeles, it creates a fictional topography of cities, stores, malls, businesses, etc., that don't exist. But the opposite seems to be true for the Bay Area, and for that matter, of the rest of the places mentioned in the novel. The novel is mostly mappable, uh, including the invented duchies of Squamuli and Faggio. So, however, as the story with the Königsberg Bridges, the narrative is also important. It's important to remember that these are, these are not just arbitrary places in a fixed space, in a slide. They, Pinchon unwinds them for us in order. And so I wanted to see if it's the case that it's just that, so just like fictional places are clustered around Los Angeles, if it's also the case that fictional places are clustered within the text, if they're narratively clustered. So this chart sort of uh, shows the difference between, so this chart shows the difference between real and fictional places in the novel. And, and you can see that uh, it grows, which means that more and more real places are being mentioned as opposed to fictional places. Um, and most notable, or very notable, for example, is this surge right here, which is uh, around page 49, incidentally, when Peter Fallopian begins to explain the Peter Penguin Society and then its slow descent shortly thereafter um, when the tale of Squamulia and Faggio follows. So, and I, this, the story of the Peter Pinguid conspiracy and the Peter Pinguid society is fascinating to me because it's a fantastic conspiracy about a boat, the disgruntled, that provides the narrator of the novel with opportunities to put into motion the geopolitical intrigue surrounding the US Civil War. So it's not just North versus South, but Russia's in the mix. England's in the mix, uh, France is in the mix. And a skirmish may or may not have occurred off of Pismo Beach, or maybe it was off of Karma by the Sea. And nevertheless, as Fallopian says, the very first military confrontation between Russia and America occurred. So you have all of this collapsing geopolitical information related to the Cold War, all within this tightly, densely described conspiracy theory. So it's an origin story for the Cold War just before Oedipa herself learns of the Tristero, the invisible organization whose existence, or lack thereof, consumes the rest of the novel and Oedipa. But again, remember that this unfolding of information about the Tristero comes alongside, initially, that substantial bump of real as opposed to fake geography. So it's only through the details of the Courier's tragedy, this long play, 
uh, during Oedipa's trip to the Fangosa Lagoons that the, the fictionality of the novel catches up to that initial that ramp of real places. So I, this is changing that earlier chart a little bit to sort of demonstrate this tension between the real and fictional a bit more clearly. Because real places are mentioned far more frequently than fictional places, uh, in this chart, I've normalized the data assuming it's 50-50. So the, the, the more above zero it is, the more real places are being mentioned below, the more fictional. The tendencies are the same, and we get this spike in reality. This is the same thing that I just mentioned with the Peter Penguin Society. But uh, we see this huge well of fictionality follow. And then it starts this uptick, reestablishing itself in a world that is relatable to the reader. And not coincidentally, that uptick is right at the start of chapter 5, when Oedipa decides to leave San Narciso and continue her sleuthing for the Tristero in the Bay Area. Uh, J. Carey Grant lingers on the should here. Um, noting the implication that there was a correct path for Oedipa to take in the first place in order to solve the question of the Tristero. And this is what we'll be talking, or what I'll be talking about for the, end of, or for the rest of this. So this is something resembling a representation of Oedipa's 24-hour wandering and driving in Berkeley and San Francisco. I'm preparing this, I actually noticed that Oedipa actually strands her car and somehow magically gets it back, a little bit of a continuity error or something. She gets a hotel room in the Berkeley Hills up here, uh, visits the Lectern Press, drives to their warehouse in Oakland, then goes back to Berkeley, meets with Nephastus, flees him, starts driving on autopilot, ends up crossing the Bay Bridge into San Francisco, where she spends time in North Beach, before drifting into a state of confusion that takes her to Chinatown. Uh, let me show these on to Chinatown, the Golden Gate Park, uh, the city beach over here, Fillmore, the airport down here and eventually all the way back to Embarcadero here, um, where she gets a letter to drop in the mailbox. So though Oedipa's conversation during this time, during this passage, mostly take place in uncertain locations like Nephastus's house, which is somewhere around here, uh, the Greek Way or the Mexican diner on 24th, and the, oh, sorry, and the transient hotel in the Embarcadero, nevertheless, her foggy journey still sticks to certain landmarks that are very mappable. And at the beginning of this wandering, Oedipa walks into this infected city. The pathogen of the post horn begins to reproduce itself at a rapid rate. And where earlier she hardly ever sees this post horn, now it's everywhere. And the reference to the map here is, is telling in its own way. Oedipa thinks that she's looking at a map, but in places on the map, but even so, it's illegible. It re represents something to her, or it represents nothing to her, it records no space. So in Nightwood, the different characters are spatially distributed differently. We can see how Jenny creates edges that Nora can't push through, and how the image of Robin's freedom in the night becomes an obstacle for Nora when she tries to move through the city similarly. And, but here, instead of a distribution, of regions like Lynch's image, we see instead a kind of layering, or even better, as Jesus Arabo uh, explains in the novel, an intrusion of another world. Hence the charts to begin this section. The familiar San Francisco, legible to readers of Pinchon's novel, is intruded upon by the world of Tristero. Oedipa could have just as easily have seen the post horn distributed around San Narciso. She first learns about it then, and all the leads that she gets about the Tristero lead her back to San Narciso anyway. But it doesn't work that way. Instead, during a particularly rich section of the novel in terms of quote-unquote real-world geographic data, is when the Tristero marks itself most visibly. But because a kind of withdrawal is impossible, a new world, a space cut across and spliced, perhaps transversed, needs to be created. So this brings us back to Lynch's image of the city, the breathing, lively space that exists outside of a map, but also outside of simply a narrative. The only reason we know, for example, when telling the story that we haven't managed to cross all the bridges in Königsberg is because we already know ahead of time, as drunk as we are, that we're on the castle side of the river and have no more bridges with which we can cross back onto Kneiphof. And so the last, the last line from Crying of Lafarnan that I'll quote 
uh, could just as easily be from Nightwood. So in separating these places out, mentioned in Pinchon's novel, I'm inflicting a sort of binary just for the sake of creating an argument. But I think I've also shown uh, that the binary not, enforced, not only reinforces itself, but attracts attention to itself. You know, again, when Oedipa is wandering in the real recognizable San Francisco, that's when she's in contact with Silent Tristero's empire. The worlds are colliding and drawing a new map. Her difficulty of sorting the night into real and dreamed reflects that of the reader, who is also stitching maps together, not as layers with a fictional world atop a real world, but as collisions. Recall the opening of this chapter of chapter five, where the narrator suggests that Oedipa should have done something, showing that different possibilities and different outcomes were always pressing against each other. So I'll finish up with Nightwood here, and I'll re return to that brief part of the novel that was, that's Holy Robbins. Amy Wells finds Robbins straying towards the convent particularly notable, because although it's totally ignored in touristic Paris, uh, to the degree that in, in Plum's critical edition, Plum lists the convent as unknown, location unknown. The convent is notable for being the final resting place of Lafayette, meaning it contributes to the intruding Americanized Paris atop the Paris of the old churches Robin visits, an intrusion duplicated by the arrivals of the Americans Robin, Nora O'Connor, and of course, excuse me, Juna Barnes herself. So Wells, argues for something uh, rather similar to what Jonathan Flatley calls an affective map, the picture, quote, we all carry around with us on which are recorded the affective values of the various sites and situations that constitute our social world. An affective image of the city and lingering affective relationship to America brings Robin to this hybridized space where even soils are mixed. Uh, it's soil from the top of Bunker Hill that's, that's on uh, Lafayette's casket. So the pull of America brings Robin and Jenny to the US, where Robin begins wandering again until she ends up out west on Nora's property, interacting with Nora's dog um, in a scene that's read as sexual, bestial, unstable, and more. But it is certainly also a culmination of the human-animal hybridity explicit in Robin throughout the novel. When we first see her, she's very famously uh, referred to as an eland, a uh, uh, kind of antelope, in a bridal veil. The intrusion of another world in Pinchon is also the intrusion of Robin on Nora's world, the intrusion of the canine into the Robinine, as it were, in all of its senses. So for Doreen Massey, space is endlessly generative by its very nature, and the talks here at this conference have reaffirmed this insight from multiple vantage points. So while, like in Euleria and Königsberg, a map can become so specifically aligned with a task as to become useless, in Barnes's Paris and Pinchon's Bay Area, the map also provides a place for us to put these, quote, potentially dissonant or concordant narratives into clearer conversation. So just as the image of the city is per persistently being rebuilt as the people walk through the city, and after the map, or, sorry, being rebuilt as the people walk through the city, so too does the map always change with every rereading. And after the map, the texts themselves, and ultimately the, word, the world's hosting intrusions and remaining, the, and ultimately the world's hosting these intrusions uh, remain forever different because of them. In the Odyssey, Odysseus chooses against facing the wandering rocks as Circe warns him, no one has ever passed through them alive, uh, save the Argo, and that was with a big assist from Hera. And so in this talk, I've, I've pitched the rocks as, that's an unintended pun. I've <laughs> pitched the rocks as resembling the edges of Lynch's image of the city. But as a final thought, I want, want us to remember, importantly, that they too are wanderers, moving through space and constituting these new processes. Building on Nick's uh, image from last night of the idea of space moving through us, I think back to how even if edges keep Jenny and Nora apart, the wandering rocks also carry uh, the trace of the intrusion of the new, the collision with and stitching together of the other. Uh, here's a bibliography, and thank you very much.